Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another video. My name is Dylan and I'm a cycling coach at CTS. And today we're going to be talking about using aero bars for gravel racing. My mission here will be to squash this notion that aero bars are somehow uncool for gravel racing. And in case you aren't aware of just how much of an advantage aero bars are, I'll be going over that as well. If you're new to this channel, I make weekly training, racing, and gear related videos going over tips and tricks that I've learned in my 12 years of racing experience and as a cycling coach at CTS. If you wanna learn how to get faster or just more about the science of training in general, then be sure to subscribe. And if you have a training question or a topic you'd like to see me cover in a future video, then be sure to leave it down in the comments section below. I do my best to get to all the questions in the comments. This video idea was sparked by the most recent GCN show titled, is gravel riding as cool as it thinks it is? I've left the link for that video in the description below, so be sure to check it out. In that video, Dan and Cy discuss whether or not gravel riding is becoming uncool because people are taking it too seriously. And of course, there was a lengthy discussion about aero bars. Now, their position in the video was pretty neutral, so this isn't necessarily a response to them, but it is the spark for a discussion. Are aero bars cool or not? Let's ignore the fact that as cyclists, we wear tight pants for fun, so talking about the coolness of anything is probably outside of our wheelhouse. Now, before I start, you might be thinking, Dylan, I thought you were all about science and research and other nerdy stuff like that. Isn't whether or not something is cool subjective, so therefore this is just gonna be your opinion? Yes, this video very much will just be my opinions, but that doesn't mean I don't have some science to explain why we think some things are cool and some things are uncool, so be sure to stick around for that. That being said, this channel is all about making you a faster cyclist, and aero bars are undoubtedly faster, so it should come as no surprise as to what side of the debate I'm on. Before I go into how cool aero bars are and whether or not they're making gravel uncool, let's first talk about how much faster they are in case you're not aware. A study on the aerodynamics of a cycling position used wind tunnel testing to determine that the TT position can produce a drag reduction on the order of 20%. So what does this actually mean in terms of time savings? Since the presenters were talking about Dirty Kanza, I'm gonna use DK as an example of how much time you could save in that event using aero bars. The disclaimer here is that everyone's different, and I'm just using generic numbers from a website called bikecalculator.com to make my calculations. It's also worth noting that aero bars take getting used to, so an aero bar noob might not be able to produce the same amount of power as they normally do. Now let's say that in 200 miles of racing, you can only actually use the aero bars for a fourth of the time because the rest of the time you'll be climbing or descending or drafting in the pack where you'll need your hands on the hoods or the drops. So that's 50 miles where you can use the aero bars. According to a quick calculation on bikecalculator.com, that would save you 22 minutes. As far as I'm concerned, that's the end of the discussion right there. They're faster, what more do you need to know? But I'll keep going. This is not an insignificant amount of time. At a race like DK, 20 minutes could be 20 places or more. Nope, not worth it. I'd rather get last place than butcher my bike like that. You can go take your aero bars to the nearest triathlon. Now, obviously, as I said, these are rough calculations and there are a lot of factors we aren't considering, but the point here is that we're talking about tens of minutes of potential savings. This isn't a marginal gain, this is a significant one. Considering that the winner, Colin Strickland, soloed for 105 miles and won by just nine minutes, it's safe to say that had he not had aero bars on his bike, he probably would have gotten caught and lost the race. Now to every single aero bar hater out there, I ask you this question. Would it have been cooler for Colin to win the race with aero bars or lose the race without them? The last I checked, this isn't a fashion competition, it's a bike race. And the moment we start caring more about how cool we look than how fast we're going is when I start to shake my head. Cycling is a quirky sport that attracts quirky people and that's part of what I love about it. And Dirty Kanza may just be the pinnacle of that. Where else can you find so many people that are stoked about suffering on their bike all day in one place? You've gotta be a little insane just to sign up for a race like that, let alone win it or even finish it. One of the things that I think is awesome about Dirty Kanza and other unsanctioned races is that you can ride whatever you want. You can ride a mountain bike, a road bike, a fat bike, whatever you have. And in the case of the people trying to win 
or get a faster time, you can ride whatever bike setup you think will get you across the 200 miles fastest. The majority of this controversy about aero bars has been stirred up by pro mountain biker Jeff Kabush, who has been very public about his distaste for aero bars during Dirty Kanza. Yeah man, Jeff Kabush said using aero bars for Kanza is totally lame, and he's a badass mountain biker. I mean, dude, didn't you see his custom skin suit? Hashtag aero what, am I right? This is of course coming from the guy who won last year's Iceman, which is a mountain bike race, using a gravel bike with drop bars. When Velo News asked him what the advantages of using a gravel bike were, he said, just having the drop bars, it's almost like being in an aero tuck on a mountain bike. It's a really high average speed, over 30k an hour, so it's a bit more like a road race, especially near the end. I attacked and got away with Alexei Vermeulen. We were in a little breakaway and it made it easier to roll at speed when we snuck away near the end. Hmm, this sounds really familiar. I wonder where I've heard this argument before. If using unconventional equipment to gain an aero advantage in a mountain bike race is cool, then why is it uncool when you do it for gravel racing? Let's jump right into the heart of why aero bars are considered uncool, or really why anything in life is considered uncool, and that's because it's unconventional or doesn't fit within social norms. And conformity may be a lot more powerful than you realize it is. In Solomon Ash's classic psychology experiment on conformity, he had subjects perform a simple task where they matched lines of the same length. As we can see from the example, the target line obviously matches up with line C. The twist though was that Ash had subjects perform the test in a room full of people who purposefully agreed that the wrong answer was correct. What he found was that on average about one third of the participants who were placed in this situation went along and conformed with the clearly incorrect majority on the critical trials. Over the 12 critical trials, about 75% of participants conformed at least once and 25% of participants never conformed. And in the control group with no pressure to conform to confederates, less than 1% of participants gave the wrong answer. This experiment had a huge impact on the study of psychology and conformity and gave us an insight into just how powerful conformity is. Even when an answer is blatantly false, 75% of us will cave and go with the popular opinion. This explains a lot about society as a whole, but let's apply it to this aero bar situation. When asked the question, should you run aero bars for Dirty Kanza, the obvious answer is yes. They're clearly faster, and making this decision is about as easy as matching those two lines. The reason so many people choose not to, regardless of what justification they claim to use, is because of conformity. The pro peloton doesn't use them, most people don't use them when they go out and ride, and there's a pro mountain biker who's telling me not to use them, so I'm not going to use them either. Making the decision not to use aero bars in a race like Dirty Kanza is not unlike matching those lines incorrectly when everyone else did. Conformity in cycling goes beyond aero bars too. When Team Sky first started wearing skin suits for road races, everyone laughed. Now, everyone does it. It used to be uncool to ride a 29 inch wheeled bike for downhill racing, and now most of the World Cup racers are on 29 inch wheel bikes. Some may argue that aero bars are less safe, but I'd argue that it's a lot safer than the alternative that I see a lot of pros and amateurs alike using, which is resting your forearms on your bar tops. I've certainly seen a lot of non aero bar users attempting that. People know not to use TT bars when drafting in the pack and wait for when they're either pulling or solo. And in a race like Dirty Kanza, there are gonna be times when you're by yourself battling the wind. The use of aero bars goes beyond gravel racing as well to marathon mountain bike racing, for example. Todd Wells has used aero bars to win the Leadville 100. Jeremiah Bishop set the course record at the Shenandoah 100 using aero bars and I myself have used aero bars to win numerous 100 mile mountain bike races. If there's a significant amount of road or gravel in a mountain bike race, then it's advantageous to have aero bars on your bike. In summary, aero bars are faster, so stop worrying about how cool or uncool you look when you're using them in unsanctioned races where they're perfectly legal. Because you wanna know what's cooler than looking cool? Going faster. What makes gravel racing unique and interesting is its lack of rules. For a lot of people, DK is just a personal adventure and an epic day on the bike, but just like with everything in life, there are people that take it seriously and want to go fast and win, and part of the gravel game right now is that you can ride any kind of bike that you think will make you do that. And to Jeff Kabush, it's all love, man. I've looked up to you since I first started mountain biking, and you've been a source of inspiration for me. 
Everything I said in this video is just in the spirit of debate. At DK last year, I was just happy to stay with you as long as I could before you dropped me. Maybe I'll sign up for it again next year and I'll try to hang with you as long as I can. But one thing's for sure, I'll definitely have aero bars on my bike because I need all the help I can get. If you guys are interested in trying out aero bars, I left a link in the description for the ones that I use. They're just some cheap ones from China that I intended on upgrading, but they work just fine and they're relatively light around 300 grams. Thanks for watching and I hope you guys found this information helpful. Be sure to let me know your opinion on using aero bars for gravel racing in the comments section down below. If you like this video, be sure to give it a like, share it with a friend, and subscribe for more. If you want to see more training and racing content, be sure to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you want to follow my training, check me out on Strava. And if you're looking for a coach, shoot me an email at djohnson at trainwright.com.